uh, today, our first speaker is Jill Smith. She's a medical doctor. She uh, uh, used to work at Penn State, then she worked here at NIH, and now she's a professor of medicine at Georgetown. And her title, Translational Research, Bench to Bedside Clinical Trials. Jill. Thank you, Dr. Moody. Okay. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Let's see. I guess the most important thing is, can the guy in the back hear me or something? Can he hear me okay? Whatever. So h how many of you are MDs? Anybody? Anybody PhD? Okay. Okay, good. And are all of you doing research? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm a clinician scientist, so I take care of patients and I also do bench research. So we're an endangered species. <laughs> so whatever, this is what the NIH wants, but you know, we're an endangered species. I have some disclosures. Um, I'm a co-inventor on some patents and I do some consulting work for some biotech companies. Can you hear me okay back there? Okay. Um, the objectives of what we're going to talk about today is to understand how an idea can be taken from the research lab to patient care. We're going to learn about the steps in conducting a clinical trial, um, understand some of the obstacles uh, to overcome for drug development, and I'll give you some examples from some of my research and how we're taking that into the clinic and what are the pitfalls of doing this enterprise. So. So first of all, this is kind of, and does this, I don't know if this works. Does this work? Okay, maybe I don't have a pointer. But um, there we go, kind of. So as far as most of us are in this phase, which is the preclinical research, and there are lots of ideas, there's lots of drugs that are being tested, a lot of compounds that you're testing in the lab. But then as far as which one of these actually make it through, and make it into drug development. So there is this bottleneck and there's very few drugs that actually make it and make it all the way through. Um, <clears throat> and this was kind of an overview. There's a, a, a paper that talks about drug development and the overall probability of success, you know, if, if you look at this, is that it, it shows you that, um, if I could go here, so of all the drugs, about 30% of those drugs that are tested preclinical actually make it to phase one trials. So a lot of them fall by the wayside. And this kind of shows you the probability of success and then the probability you know, of moving on to the next stage. So you know, once, once you actually get all the way over to here and if you've um, gotten approval and a new drug application approval, things are pretty good. You're most likely going to make it. But, you know, in the early stages, you know, it's very, you know, less than half of the drugs or even fewer make it that far. And then the other thing to just kind of point out from this slide is how long does it take? You know, people always say, how long did it take you from when you did that cell culture experiment and tested it in animals and took it to a trial? When did it get approved? You know, so the preclinical, and here it says, you know, preclinicals takes one to six years. Um, you know, if you can do that during your postdoc training and get something done in that period of time, that's great. But then it takes, it says, six to 11 years um, to get through all the clinical trials and then to get approval, it moves faster once you get through the different phases of the trial. And then there's all this post-marketing and that's where the pharmaceutical companies make their money back usually. So, um, <clears throat> so as far as drug development in the United States, so it takes an average of 12 years for an experimental drug to go from the lab to the clinic. And uh, so that's longer than most of your training. And about only five in 5,000 drugs that enter preclinical testing can go ahead and move on to human testing. So one of these five drugs that are tested in human is actually approved. So that means that the chance of a new drug actually making it to the market is approximately one in 5,000. But it's gotta be your drug, right? <laughs> so, so don't let this discourage you, but this is actually what happens. And that's why you have to think about these things and what is gonna make your drug outstanding or your treatment. 
So the process of getting a drug approved, of course, involves the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. And then the FDA requires a certain sequence of tests that I have listed down there. And we'll kind of go through these and what's required to get a drug developed. So most of us are in this stage. Um, any of you working with animals? Anybody? OK. So a lot of the preclinical testing done in the research lab, um, it's, and it's absolutely necessary. You have to do the, the cell culture work, and then you have to test it in an animal model. Some of the FDA requires two different animal models before they'll allow you to move it on to a human trial. Um, so these are essential. And this part is so critical in the record keeping and stuff that you're doing at this phase, because this is the area where if there are not good records and there are not good research done at this stage, why the drugs fall off when they don't make it to the phase one trials. So this is important. Record everything in your notebook, whether you think it's important or not, because any observation you see may become important in a clinical trial. So a phase one trial is actually just testing a drug once it's been tested in the animals then you want to know, well, can you test it in a human being? And if you can, is it safe to give to a human being? The phase one trial does not care about efficacy. They don't care whether it works or not. So some phase one trials are actually done in normal controls, uh, but they want to know, is it safe? And how should the treatment be given? You need to learn a little bit about the pharmacokinetics once you give the drug in a human being. You know, is it orally absorbed? Is it better if you have to, do you have to give it intravenously? Can you give it subcutaneously? So it's mainly about safety and toxicity. That's what the phase one trial is about. And it doesn't take a lot of people to do that. Then the phase two trial is the efficacy trial. And so in the efficacy trial, you have to have more patients and you have to have a primary endpoint. Uh, it's usually done a, a blinded study or unbiased. So it's usually a randomized double blind placebo control trial. Um, <clears throat> and you really want to know in the phase two, how does the drug work? Is it more effective than placebo? And um, it doesn't necessarily compare it to other treatments. However, in cancer therapy, it's a little bit different because our research committees and the FDA won't allow us usually to put cancer patients on placebos. So these, these phase two studies are typically compared to standard of care. And then the phase three trial is a lot more people. You have to have an equal chance of being assigned to one or two or even three treatment groups. And you want to know how does this treatment compare to the standard of care? And there are different pharmaceutical companies will typically do either a superiority trial. Is their new treatment better than what's out there? Or is it a non-inferiority trial? It just means it's just as effective, but maybe they have an added benefit, like it only has to be given once a day rather than three times a day, or it's less expensive. So there may be another edge of why their drug even though it's just as good as the standard of care, the FDA might consider it as a non-inferiority trial to approve it. And then once a drug gets approved by the FDA, then you do the phase four trials, which involve hundreds to thousands. And this is often called the post-marketing trials. And this is where they want additional information. For example, when the hepatitis B vaccination was approved and they did huge studies with hepatitis B and they wanted to know did it decrease the incidence of hepatitis B around the world? And so those were the large phase four trials, but it was after it was already approved. So there's a pilot trial. And so a pilot trial, and this is where many of us, where we're going from the bench to the bedside, and we want to test it in a couple of people um, just to find out what will be the sample size that you're going to need to do your phase two ran randomized placebo control trial and to work out some of the issues. So, and lots of us can get, you know, departmental funding or pilot grants to do pilot trials just to test something out. So, so that's best what it is, the first venture into an area that it's never been done today to work out some of the difficulties and to determine the sample size. 
so back when I was at Penn State, I did a pilot trial actually in Crohn's disease, testing out a drug. And we tested it in like 25 patients. And it was an open label study. We knew everybody was getting the compound. And, but that gave us some information about how well it was tolerated, what was the best dose to use. And then I knew kind of how well it worked so that then my statistician could tell me, okay, these are how many patients you're gonna need to show efficacy going into a phase two trial. So, and you're gonna need to have those calculations for the FDA or for your IRB so you know how many patients for your sample size. And that's what the randomized clinical trials are. Um, with the randomized clinical trials, you have an equal chance of being in one or two groups. And <clears throat> the one group, you know, is usually the most widely accepted treatment or the standard of care. And the other group is the, I mean, the new treatment. And then the other group is the placebo or the standard of care. Um, the important thing is, is that you want these groups to be as similar as possible because when you randomly allocate people, if you're testing, for example, you wanna know if their tumors shrink you know, on this treatment, uh, you wanna make sure that all the patients who get randomized to the treatment arm don't have tumors that are significantly smaller than those that are getting the placebo because then that will falsely skew your data. So whatever your outcome is gonna be for your end point of the study, that's what you have to randomize by. So if your outcome is gonna be response with size to the therapy, then you wanna make sure that when you enroll patients that they have pretty much equal size at the beginning. Um, so so that's, that's an important point because people don't always do that. Um, and other things, you know, sometimes people randomize by gender, sometimes people randomize, but if that's not gonna change your outcome, those points may not be as important as whatever your final outcome is going to be, that's what you have to randomize by. So then how are the patient's rights protected? Well, there are ethical and legal codes that we do in medical practice that apply to the clinical trials. And the most important thing is you have to do an informed consent. Um, that means not just that they sign a piece of paper, but they actually are informed and they know what they're doing. Um, and the informed consents have become so complicated. I can remember when I started doing this, they were a couple pages long. Now they're about 28 pages and you're trying to get patients to read through these and sign it and understand it, but it's required. Um, and then in order to do a study, it has to be approved by different committees like the IRB is the big committee and they have to approve your protocol before it can move forward, as well as if it's an investigational drug, the FDA has to approve it. And the last thing is, is if you're doing anything where you're collecting blood samples, or you're gonna do DNA analysis or sequencing, or anything that might uh, show, like you're looking for a SNP in a population of patients that might predispose them to cancer, then you need to have a special paragraph in there about genetic testing. And if they can leave their samples with you after the end of the study, or if they have to dispose of all of their samples at the end of the study. Yes? Just, just to clarify, the IRB would come into play phase one, but FDA is not necessarily a phase one? They're, they're involved with both FDA and the IRB. Every clinical, every clinical trial has to be approved by the IRB. If it's a, a involving a drug or a therapeutic then it ha or a device, then it has to go through the FDA. If you're just doing like population studies or epidemiological studies, that doesn't have to go through the FDA because you're not applying a treatment. If you're doing a retrospective study and you're looking at data, you don't have to get the approval of the FDA. So the FDA is involved when you're testing a new treatment, okay? Um, but, but the IRB, anytime you're doing any sort of research on patients, you have to have the IRB approval. Now there are some that the, you still have to go through the IRB if you're doing say um, specimens that are in a bio repository and they've all been, uh, you know, they are no, the coding on it so that there's no identifiers. You still have to get permission from the IRB saying that, that you're exempt 
from IRB approval. So the patients won't have to sign a consent because some of those samples are from deceased patients. So you can't get consent. Um, but you still have to get approval from the IRB or say that your protocol is IRB exempt and you get that in writing from the IRB. So, so there are certain circumstances. So thank you for asking, yeah. Um, but you do have to, if you are doing genetic testing, that's an important thing because it could lead to, if somebody finds out that they have a gene that predisposes them to cancer and it's in their records, it could affect their insurance. So they have to know that what they're signing and they have to give permission. So then how do you get an FDA approval? Well, there's a process. And the first thing you do is you apply for what you call an investigational new drug or the application for that, or an IND. And there are two forms that you need to start this process called the 1571 and the 1572 form. And when, and I have a copy of that so you can see what they look like, and they're online. You just log in FDA 1571 or two and you can fill them out. Um, if you submit your application to the FDA and if the FDA does not disapprove of it in 30 days, you get your number. So the FDA, the clock starts ticking as soon as they re receive your application. And the application has to include a lot of important information. And it has to include things, if you, if I can get my thing to work here. I don't know if I can get the pointer to work. But you have to say, you know, where the study is going to be done. What's the chemical structure of the compound? How does it work in the body? What are the toxic effects found in the animal studies? This is where the animal studies are critical and everything that you've done in the lab, you have to submit all of that to the FDA because they want to know the animal studies, they want to know the toxicology studies. If you've done any IC50 studies in cell culture, they need to have all that information. And then, you know, how are you going to make the compound? Is it a synthetic? Is it a natural compound? Whatever. And then after the IND gets the you know, most of the IRBs at the universities or at the institutes require you to have an IND number in order to move forward with your research. So, so typically what I do is I apply first to the FDA for my IND number and I submit my whole, all the records and the protocol to the FDA because the FDA may ask you for changes. Once the FDA approves your protocol, then I send that protocol to our IRB and say, this has been approved by the FDA, and then the IRB reviews it. Uh, but typically, if it's been approved by the FDA, it'll move faster through the IRB. Or if it's been peer reviewed by uh, a study section at the NIH or one of those um, committee meetings, and it's already been approved and it's been peer reviewed, and then the IRB will usually you know, look, they'll read through it and see if they have any criticisms or changes that you have to make. But typically that makes the process move faster. So, so this is what a 1571 form looks like and it's very hard to see at this stage, but uh, it, it asks you mainly for your name. And when you get assigned an IND number, you have to include that number on every single one of these forms that you submit. The other thing is, is that with your initial application, you won't have the IND number, but they'll assign that to you. But you have to always include the serial number. So the first time you submit your application to the FDA, its serial number is going to be zero. And then every other communication after that, if they say, oh, please send us your bio sketch, you have to send them another 1571 and then with your bio sketch, and that will say this is number one. Then the next communication with them will be number two. And you have to keep records of all of these communications. So every time you communicate with the FDA, you have to submit a 1571 and keep records of which communication this is. So, and then they ask you, what are you including in this? And I think I have, oops, no, I don't have. It. So down at the bottom, um, it, there's little check boxes and you, they ask you, what are you including with this 1571? Is it a response to what FDA asked you to do? Is it a new protocol? Is it a change to your protocol? Whatever, and you just check the box of what you're including with this 1571 form. So the other thing I wanna mention is intellectual property. 
And, you know, we don't often think about that when we're in the lab working with animals or at the bench or when you're getting ready to prepare for your poster presentation. Uh, you've submitted your abstract. It is very important that if you're going to go and present your research at any meeting, whether it be, you know, institutional or national meeting, that before you do that, you should talk to the intellectual property office at your institution or university. Because as soon as you do a public disclosure of your research, it no longer can be patented. And the reason why it's important is because pharmaceutical companies are not interested in taking your product, no matter how good it is, into the clinic unless they can have patent rights. So, so it's really important if you're submitting an abstract before you send that in that you talk to the IP people. Just send them your abstract and say, is there anything here that you think we should patent first? And the process is easy because what they do is they submit a provisional patent, which only costs about 500 bucks, I think. And the universities will do that. And that will protect your rights to this in intellectual property even after you go and you submit your abstract and then you do your poster and then that then you have one year from the time that you submit your provisional patent until you have to submit the full patent and then you decide after a year goes by is this something that's going to move forward in the science and I can take this out and maybe we'll get a good discovery you have one year from the time you submit your provisional, but that protects you. So think about that when you're going out to research meetings. Um, so these are just some of the things that you do for a clinical trial, writing the protocol, which is always hard to do, writing the consent form, getting your IRB approval. And those things, you know, may be hard, but the harder thing is getting the funding, finding a sponsor, somebody who's gonna pay for your research, you know, and. And, and as research money is becoming less and less, that's, that's hard to do because you have to have money to pay for the research. Um, you have to understand the responsibilities of being the pr principal investigator. And in order to do clinical trials, whether you are an MD or a PhD, you have to do what we call the city training. And that's an online training on how to conduct, conduct ethically clinical trials. And um, you have to do the city training and pass your city training in order to have an IRB approval. So everybody has to be what they call city trained. And then the other thing is, is that before you start, if you get approval and you move through this process, before you enroll your first patient, you have to register your clinical trial on the clinicaltrials.gov website. And, and that's required. If you don't do that and you enroll a patient and they sign the consent form and it's dated on a date that precedes you registering your trial, you're not allowed to publish your results. So that, that's a hard liner, but you're not. And then you have to, once you finish your results of the trial, you are required to upload them on the website. And if you get a publication, it's easier. You can upload the publication and it has to be available for the public domain to see what are the results of your trial. Um, but this is, this is an important thing, just little things to think about. You know, before you're all excited, you're gonna enroll your first patient, you have to put it online or otherwise you can't publish it. So this is just kind of the format of a protocol that you have, you know, what's the title, what's your rationale, uh, ethical considerations, the timetable and, and et cetera. Um, and this is just an example of like a protocol that, that I did. And it, it tells you, you know, for example, what's the study title? Um, how, is it a phase one or phase two or both a phase one and phase two trial? How long is the study gonna last? What drugs are you using in the trial? And what are your objectives? What are your primary and secondary objectives? And then you have to tell them what your study design is and how many centers you're using, how many patients you're gonna enroll, who's gonna be in your patients, what are your inclusion, exclusion criteria, et cetera, your sample size and so forth. So those, that's like an outline of what you have to put in a protocol. Um, so then the next thing is, is where most of us are still working with the mice. So you've got a 25 gram mouse and you've been giving them this compound five milligrams per kilo 
and you're getting a good response in your tumor and you want to test it in a human being, how do you know how much to give them? You don't want to kill the human being. You don't want to give them too much. So, so you want to study the safety and toxicity in humans. You're first in human trial. And I did a study in a, a drug called OGF. And we actually started, you know, I did all the dosing in the mice. And then I had to figure out how much am I going to give a human being? Well, there is a formula that you can use. And here's the reference for it. It should be in your handout. Um, depending on what your animal model was that you were using and the surface area, you can actually calculate what the human expected dose is. And you want, and there's this formula down here based upon the human expected dose, based upon the weight of your animal, and the dose that you found that caused no observed adverse effect levels, which is NOL. But that will help you calculate where do you start, rather than just guessing. So when I did a, a clinical trial, you know, we kind of used this. And then we figured out what would be you know, the dose. And then we don't know, well, how high can we go before we reach toxicity? So when you do a phase one trial, you usually pick your dose based upon what animal models you used, and then you tend to lower it, start lower than what you think you might need in a 60 to 70 kilogram person. And then you enter, it's called a three plus three phase one trial. You enter, you know, uh, three people at one dose, and we started at 50 micrograms per kilo. And then uh, you look and see if you have any toxic effects. If you get two to three toxic effects in three people, you usually have to stop, okay? That's the wrong dose. You picked the wrong dose. Um, if you get no effects, then you can go up to the next dose and if, so forth. So that's how you do it. This is a classic three plus three study design. And the purpose of that is with the safety and toxicity, finding out what we call the MTD or the maximum tolerated dose. So, um, that's what we did in this one study. And I, I want you to know that I started off, I calculated the dose to give the first patient based upon my animal studies. And the first patient, you know, had abdominal pain and was vomiting. And I thought, oh dear, what did I do? But it turned out it was her pancreatic cancer actually that I was trying to treat. I did go ahead and I dosed the other two patients in the study and they did just fine. So we moved on to the next dose. And then we moved on and we moved on until we got up to the maximum tolerated dose. So the dose that I had started at at 50, you know, was actually what I tested it in two other people was just fine. So we were able to escalate and we ended up finding that our maximum tolerated dose was 250. So if I had stopped back here, we wouldn't have even reached our maximum tolerated dose. So it's important to also know, you know, somebody with pancreatic cancer, maybe their nausea and vomiting is not due to the drug. It might be due to the disease. So, you know, you have to take all that into consideration. So, but this is how you do a three plus three study design. So, so some of my research, and I'll just show you some of the examples about what we're doing and what we're planning to take to the clinic and what we've done. So, so pancreatic cancer is, is anybody here working on pancreatic cancer? No, nobody? Oh, darn. Okay, well that's, okay. So it's the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, about 56,000 a year. With our best drugs, the maximum median survival is 11 months. It's the worst tumor, the worst prognosis, and it doesn't even make it to one year. We don't even talk about five-year survivals with pancreatic cancer, except, you know, 6%, maybe, if you're surgically operated on but most patients present with advanced disease. So um, most people are not diagnosed early and currently there is no real effective therapy that cures pancreatic cancer, unless you can cut it all out with surgery. So, so this is the deaths from pancreatic cancer, just to show you that the cases have been rising. Um, and it's, like I said, it's already surpassed colorectal cancer and it's past breast cancer. And so Dr. Moody has still got me beaten. Lung cancer is still up there, um, but it is on the rise. And so it's becoming, you know, a pie, the second to third leading cause of cancer related deaths in the United States, because there is no treatment. There's no early diagnosis. 
So some of the research I've been doing is with pancreatic cancer and dietary fat. And uh, as we all know that there's this epidemic with the metabolic syndrome in the United States, but if you look at the incidence of pancreatic cancer worldwide, and these are the highest incidences of pancreatic cancer, and then if you look at the same map showing where the high fat consumption is, and it's the same areas. So the, the countries that consume high fat diets have a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer. So that's known. So then the other thing is the metabolic syndrome. And we all know, and it's true in breast cancer and many other cancers, that obesity increases the risk of cancer. And with the metabolic syndrome, you know, you are what you eat. You know, we think that it's also related. It's been shown that obesity and high fat diet is related to pancreatic cancer also. So why is that? So this just shows that the obesity besides cancer certainly can have a lot of other effects and affect other organs besides the diabetes and other things. But our research has looked at a GI peptide called cholecystokinin or CCK. And whether any of you know what CCK is, you all have CCK in your body. CCK is a GI protein. And what happens is CCK responds to free fatty acids and certain amino acids in the diet. So if you eat fat in your diet, CCK is released. And it's released from the eye cells in the second portion of your duodenum. And it's a true hormone because it then enters the bloodstream and it circulates through the blood to come back and act on the receptors that are in the pancreas and on the gallbladder. And in the pancreas, it causes the release of digestive enzymes to help you digest your fat. The other thing it does is it causes contraction of the gallbladder so that the bile can be released into the intestine to help you emulsify the fat so that you can digest it. So CCK goes up when you eat high fat diets or any fat. That's its role is to help you digest your fat. So, um, so many years ago, we looked at, well, what is CCK and gastrin, which is another related hormone I'll talk to you about in a minute. But what we found in cell culture is that I took pancreatic cancer cells and we treated them thinking, well, people on a high fat diet, maybe their CCK level goes up. Maybe CCK is stimulating pancreatic cancer. So we did this study in cell culture and showed indeed in a dose related fashion, if you add CCK to cancer, pancreatic cancer cells, you can stimulate the growth of pancreatic cancer. So, and that happens through a CCK receptor. So then we do studies in our animals. So you test it in the cell culture, then you go to the animals. And uh, animals, we put animals on our high fat diet. So um, we, you can order these special diets. And we had the blue food, which is real greasy. It's a high fat diet, our control diet, and a low fat diet. And, and we put animals on these different diets. And then we give them pancreatic cancer, either subcutaneously or orthotopically. And we want to know, is the high fat diet stimulating growth of the cancer? So we did a couple experiments. And the first one was in nude mice. And in the nude mice, we grew the tumors subcutaneously. And then we put the mice on a high fat diet or a low fat standard sort of diet. And then um, after the animals had the tumor, we did this after the animals had the tumors, then we treated them with a cholecystokinin CCK receptor antagonist. So we're assuming that if the high fat diet raises CCK levels, if we block that effect at the receptor, maybe the tumors won't grow as much. And, and indeed, what we found was the animals that were on the high fat diet, this is measuring their tumors, their tumors got bigger on a high fat diet. So the question is, is why are their tumors getting bigger? Well, the mice that were on the high fat diet that got the CCK antagonist, their tumors were is even smaller than the controls. So it looks like that the, the effects of the high fat diet were mediated through the CCK receptor and that we could block that effect. So that's the first study, but you know that was done in human pancreatic cancer. Then we wanted to work in a syngeneic model um, which means so they have a normal immune system and we used a mouse 
pancreatic cancer so we could test in a normal environment. And we took um, a, a pancreatic cancer mouse cell line and injected it. This is it growing inside the pancreas orthotopically. And just to show you, we made some mice obese. This is a fat mouse. And if you don't know it or not, a fat mouse is a mouse that weighs 35 grams or more. That's technically, according to the literature, what a fat mouse is. So, so we took some mice and, and we made them fat and then we gave them cancer and we checked to see what happened. We looked at this in mice that were obese. We waited till they were obese till we gave them the cancer. And then we took other mice that we gave them the cancer and we euthanized the mice before they became obese because we wanted to look at the effects of obesity on cancer growth and also look at just the effects without obesity, is it just CCK? But to make a long story short, does, C does high fat diets raise CCK levels? And indeed it does. In our mice, the CCK levels were tenfold higher than the mice on the control or the low fat diet. Low fat diet actually lowers it. So um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is in our orthotopic model, what we found is that the mice on the high fat diet had bigger tumors and, and we were able to block that effect by giving them the CCK receptor antagonist. So the, and the, but the animals on the control diet, they were not having the high fat diet. There really wasn't much effect of the antagonist because they didn't have high CCK levels. So we thought, well, how do we prove that this is really CCK? So I had a couple really smart grad students and this one grad student uh, did CRISPR and knocked out the CCK receptor on our pancreatic cancer cells. And then she took some cells that were receptor null from CRISPR knockout and she grew those tumors in the mice. And then she had the wild type tumors that had the CCK receptor and put them on the high fat diet and what you can see is that if you have the receptor, CCK will stimulate the growth. If you knock out the receptor, there's no growth. With high, You can eat all the fat in the world if you don't have the CCK receptor, and you're not going to get fat, and you're not going to uh, stimulate the cancer growth. So that was we knocked out the receptor. Then we did the alternative. We, we took mice from a transgenic line that were CCK null, peptide null. So they had the receptor, but they didn't make the peptide. And then we put them on a high fat diet and we wondered, okay, they're eating a high fat diet. What happened to the tumor size? And there was no effects. So we knocked out the receptor, we knocked out the peptide. So you have to have this pathway with the CCK receptor and the peptide to stimulate growth of pancreatic cancer. So I guess the moral of the story is if you want to eat chocolate and have a high fat diet, take your CCK receptor antagonist and, and it'll prevent that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about gastrin, which is the other GI peptide. And uh, I won't make you raise your hands because everybody I'm sure has tried Prilosec, you know, OTC or Omiprazole. These are the proton pump inhibitors and they're used for acid reflux and heartburn. Um, and I'm a gastroenterologist, so we see these. These are prescribed. This is one of the most prescribed drugs, billion dollar business. So what, does the, what do the PPIs do? Well, this is normal physiology. So gastrin is secreted from the G cells in the antrum of the stomach, and gastrin gets into the circulation, and gastrin acts on the CCK receptor on both the enterocrine chromaffin cells and also maybe on the parietal cells. And then it causes the release of acid. If you block the proton pump here with any of those drugs, you completely block the, the acid release, which is good. It helps control heartburn. But what happens is you also, this feedback loop. So, so then the G cells say, oh, well, there's, there's no acid. I have to make more gastrin. And so they make more gastrin and they keep trying to make more gastrin. And when they make more gastrin, it's, it's not able to increase the acid because you're on a proton pump. However, what it does is it causes stimulation of growth of these enterochromaffin-like cells. And this is when I do an endoscopy on somebody who's on long-term proton pump inhibitors 
they grow these polyps in their stomach. And these polyps are all because gastrin is stimulating the growth of the enterochromaffin-like cells. We see this all the time. In animal models, it causes, can cause carcinoid tumors. So there's also some question of whether it can cause cancer. So I'm just proposing this idea. So this was a paper uh, that was uh, published. You know, we use these proton pump inhibitors to treat people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, okay? And we also use them in people who have Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition. And the problem is, is that we started using these proton pump inhibitors to treat, you know, the, the incidents, uh, to treat heartburn and everything back here in the 80s or so. And ever since we started using the PPIs, instead of the incidence of gastroesophageal cancer going down, it's going up and it's going up. And the other drug, the other disease that I showed you before that's going up is since we started using proton pump inhibitors, pancreatic cancer has been increasing. Both of these diseases are driven by gastrin, which is the, the protein or the peptide that goes up when you take chronic PPIs. Now, the pharmaceutical industry does not want to hear this because it's a billion dollar business, but nobody knows why the incidence of you know, esophageal cancer and pancreatic cancer is going up. And some of it may be obesity, but this is kind of a coincidence. So, so we looked at this and we actually, if you know um, embryology, gastrin is actually present in the fetal pancreas. And it has a role in the fetal pancreas that it helps with differentiation and development of the pancreas, but it's shut off at week 14 and it's not in the normal pancreas. However, it becomes re-expressed in the pancreas during pancreatic cancer, and it stimulates the growth of pancreatic cancer, just like CCK does. So gastrin and CCK are related hormones. They act at the same CCK receptor. And if you take cancer cells in culture and you give them CCK or gastrin, you'll stimulate the growth through the CCK receptor. But one thing that happens is that something happens when you're developing pancreatic cancer. So gastrin gets turned on. So this is like a normal pancreas. You've got some CCK receptors there. And when it sees, you know, CCK or gastrin floating around, um, its normal function is to make digestive enzymes to help you digest your food. But pancreatic cancer overexpresses the CCK receptor and it doesn't make digestive enzymes because cancer doesn't want to help you digest the food. The, if you stimulate the receptor, it causes proliferation. And then what happens is it starts making its own gastrin to stimulate its own growth by an autocrine mechanism. So pancreatic cancer overexpresses this receptor. It makes its own gastrin to stimulate its growth. So it can come gastrin levels that are high coming from maybe PPIs, from the G cells in the stomach, or in cancer, it comes from the cancer itself. Gastrin stimulates the growth of pancreatic cancer. So during carcinogenesis, as pancreatic cancer is developing, it goes through, and if any of you are doing prostate cancer, it goes through the development of panin-type lesions, the same sort of thing as happens in prostate cancer. And it goes through these panin-1, 2, and 3 lesions before it becomes pancreatic cancer. And what happens is gastrin and the CCK B receptor get turned on early on during pancreatic carcinogenesis. The other thing that's happening during pancreatic carcinogenesis, and this we know this from our KRAS mouse models that we use to, to study this, is that they have this increased fibrosis that goes on and the immune cells change. So if you look at the T regulatory cells, the, the CD8 cells are very low in the, the pancreatic cancer and the T regulatory cells are high and those are immune suppressive cells. So we looked at our mouse pancreas and this is why your mouse research is all important. And we, the normal mouse pancreas doesn't have CCKB receptors, but as they developed these pan and lesions, they began to express the CCKB receptor 
So we thought, oh, well, maybe if we block the CCK receptor, we can prevent pancreatic cancer. So we did a study and we took this same drug, the proglamide, and we put it in our mouse's drinking water. And this is what the drug looks like. And this is a mouse that had regular water. And this is a mouse's pancreas who had the proglamide in the water. This is an islet cell. Those are not tannins. This is a pannin lesion. So there was a significant decrease in the number of these precancerous lesions if we block gastrin's interaction at the receptor. And not only are those receptors on the pannins, but they're also present in these stellate cells, which are fibroblasts that cause the fibrosis that's associated with cancer, not just pancreatic cancer, but other cancers too. So we looked at our mice and the blue staining here shows all the fibrosis that happens in pancreatic cancer. And it's much decreased in our mice who got the proglomide. So one of the problems with pancreatic cancer and the reason why it's so bad and doesn't respond well to the therapy and the survival is only 11 months is one of the thoughts is that because of all this fibrosis here, the typical drugs like gemcitabine, the fulfirinox that we're using can't get into the cancer cells to kill it. So if you can disrupt this fibrosis or change the immune environment, you might make it so that it would respond better to therapy. So we've done some studies and you know, for years we always used the nude mouse to look at human cancer, but you can't do immune studies in the nude mouse because they don't have T cells. So if you're interested in looking at immune responses, you have to use um, a syngeneic mouse model. We use C57 black or the KRAS transgenic mouse model to look at immune response. So to make a long story short, we gave some of our mice a syngeneic pancreatic cancer, and we treated them with either PBS, a low dose of an immune checkpoint antibody, a PD-1, and you guys, anybody working with immune checkpoints? So we treated them with that or with our, our proglomide at a low dose. And we saw that there was really no effect on growth. But then if we combined the proglomide, our CCK antagonist, with the immune checkpoint, the tumors didn't grow. We also found that that caused CD8 cells to go up. And actually, the T regulatory cells go down with the combination uh, treatment. So we're thinking about doing a clinical trial to try to improve therapy for patients with pancreatic cancer by using this immune the CCK receptor antagonist with an immune checkpoint blockade. Because currently, chemotherapy doesn't work in pancreatic cancer. Immune therapy by itself doesn't work in pancreatic cancer. But if we can disrupt the environment of the, the tissue so there's less fibrosis and the immune signature changes in the tumors, we might be able to improve therapy. So we've already uh, submitted our IND number. We have an industry partner. Uh, we've gotten some funding for this and we have intellectual property secured. So those are the steps that you need to go through. So we would like to take this to a clinical trial in pancreatic cancer patients and test this, this treatment, the combination treatment. So the other problem I want to mention with pancreatic cancer is we said that the chemotherapy, you know, not only does it work, but it doesn't, it's toxic. And patients' hair fall out. They have a lot of toxicity with it. The other thing is, is that there's no good diagnostic test to pick up pancreatic cancer in the early stages because even our CAT scans and PET scans don't pick it up when it's resectable typically. So we're developing what we call a nanoparticle that we can target the CCK receptor. And it's called a theranostic compound because it, it does therapy and we can also use it for diagnosis. So what is a nanoparticle or nanotechnology? Well, it's something that's a nanometer in size between, between one and a hundred nanometers in size. So, so that's how, what a nanoparticle is. And going back to our, our figure here, so we've designed a nanoparticle that will bind to the CCK receptor on pancreatic cancer cells, and it can deliver siRNA to knock out gastrin. Now, you know that the only way that you can deliver siRNA in cell culture is if you use lipofectamine or something like that 
but using siRNA techniques in vivo are like impossible. So, so people have been trying to find good drug delivery systems to deliver gene therapy with siRNAs to knock down target proteins. So the first ones we tried were nanoliposomes, and we, we made it so that they would bind to CCK receptors. And we also tried some nanoparticles that we could try to put you know, different siRNAs, and we could put fluorophores in them. And we've been through a series of different nanoparticles and nanoliposomes. Um, the other thing that we did in order to make our nanoparticle so that it selectively targets the CCK receptor without activating the receptor, because we do not want it to stimulate growth, we designed a DNA aptamer that actually will selectively bind to the receptor, but it doesn't stimulate growth or cause signaling. And that was a whole process, but we now can take this aptamer and bind it onto our nanoparticles, and it'll go right to the, the recept to the CCK receptor. So this is again a mouse that has a pancreatic cancer growing orthotopically. And we injected this mouse with some nanoparticles that, that were loaded with a fluorophore so that we could tell if it's going to the cancer or not. The mouse over here in A got, got particles, nanoparticles that were not targeting the CCK receptor. And this animal got particles that selectively targeted the receptor. And you can see after, I think this is seven hours and 24 hours, there's really no selective binding because it, it was not target specific. But if we take our nanoparticles that are target specific and we have endocyanine green in them so we can see where the particles go, they all go to the pancreas and they're still there 24 hours later. So we can use these to image the pancreatic cancer and deliver gene therapy. And the way we're now moving on to deliver the gene therapy is we've modified our nanoparticle. Uh, we use this uh, special polyplex uh, that actually is a polylysine tail, which is positively charged. Do you know lysine's positively charged? So it'll bind to negatively charged DNA or siRNA, and it forms a micelle. And so the micelle protects our siRNA, so it's not degraded in the blood. And we can put any sort of targeting on here, so it'll go right to the receptor. And we can put fluorophores and things on there so we can follow where it goes. And this just shows our siRNA that was labeled uh, with Psi3 so that we could show that it made it into the tumor. Um, and then what we did is we took out the tumors and we did immunohistochemistry and we showed that this is gastrin expression, uh, actually gastrin protein, I'm sorry, this was by immunohistochemistry. Our targeted particles carrying the siRNA was the only one that selectively knocked down gastrin in the tumors. We had other animals that were treated with untargeted particles, even carrying the siRNA to gastrin, but it didn't get to the cancer. And then this just shows in our animal model again, we treated the mice with targeted or untargeted nanoparticles. So these ones went to the cancer. This one was carrying a scrambled control, scrambled siRNA, and this one was carrying the gastrin siRNA. And the tumors in the mice that got the targeted siRNA had smaller tumors, and none of these mice got metastases compared to all the other treatment groups. And that's just how we imaged our mice. So what are the obstacles for translational research today? Well, of course, money. <laughs> money is the problem, lack of funds, misuse of funds, disparity of funds, whatever. You know, it's always hard to get the project going. Um, I'm a clinician, uh, you know, there's more emphasis for me to see patients and bring in money clinically than there is to sit at the bench and do research. So clinicians don't always get protected research time, uh, but it, it's, you know, that's important. There's this big chiasm between industry and academia and NIH. I know when I was here, they didn't want me to work with industry, but you have to all partner together because you need an industry partner to take your drug out there. Um, then there's always problems trying to get patients to participate in research. They think they're being guinea pigs, but they're not. Um, and then again, there's no one-man bands. I mean, you, you can't do this by yourself. Um, MDs have to work with PhDs. We all have to work with, you know, have study coordinators, and it's all a team approach. So that's important, um, but, but it is important to work together. 
Um, and these are just some of my patients who participated in one of our pancreatic cancer study with their permission um, because they realized how important research was. Both of these, uh, the patient here had failed chemotherapy uh, and went on one of our experimental drugs and lived much longer than expected over three years with pancreatic cancer and same with her. So um, anyways, so what's the potential side effect of uh, using a CCK receptor blockade? Well, the only bad thing that I could think about is, you know, this is the heartburn guy that's on TV. Uh, you might not get heartburn anymore if you can block the gastrin's effect on the parietal side. So that could be a potential side effect. So, um, and this is just some of the people working in my lab and I thank you for your attention. There are other questions? So actually, I've gone through three different phases of the nanoparticles. Um, the first couple I made up at Penn State. The first one was a cationic nanoparticle, which is positively charged. And that's nice because it easily takes up the siRNA but it doesn't lose the positively charge on the outside, so it's toxic to the liver. Problem with cationic nanoliposomes. Um, the other one is actually, we're still doing research with that. Um, and, and that was also, I worked with a biomaterial science engineer up at Penn State. So PhD, you know, we worked together. I had this idea, he designed the particle. Um, and that one works real well for carrying the fluorescent probes and drugs and stuff but we couldn't get it to take up the gene therapy. So the last one that I'm working with, um, I'm actually collaborating with Dr. Steve Stern up at the NCI National Characterization Lab at Frederick. And I went to him with my idea and he helped me design the polyplex. And so we're collaborating with them and they're making the nanoparticles for us. And they ship them down to Georgetown and we test them in the animals. and. We're working on a project now, we just submitted another grant uh, to use these particles to do early imaging um, and hopefully therapy too. With Because those particles can deliver our gene, we can fluorescently label them. So I think we're, over the years, we've kind of come up with a better product and I'm sure we may do some more refining as we go, but that's kind of where it came from. So you had a question? Uh, yes. So, so acid reflux is a very common condition. Everybody gets some acid reflux. Um, but an acid reflux, um, only if it causes esophagitis, which is inflammation in the esophagus, could it increase the risk for maybe esophageal cancer because any type of chronic inflammation can cause increased risk of cancer, whether it's chronic hepatitis, chronic colitis, chronic esophagitis. However, most people who have acid reflux do not have erosive esophagitis, okay? So with that population, it's better to take a periodic, here, I'll give you my GI advice, a periodic Histamine blocker, H2 blocker, Pepsidase, Zantac, those work immediately. The PPIs take three days to work. Um, or take over the counter, you know, Gaviscon or some antacid if, if it's just a periodic one. However, in people who have chronic reflux, they should get a scope done, and I do scopes, um, just to make sure that they don't have the erosive esophagitis or a condition called Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is when you have chronic acid reflux, it changes the mucosal lining from the typical squamous epithelium to a columnar epithelium, and that does increase the risk of getting adenocarcinoma of the distal esophagus about 30-fold. So if they have Barrett's esophagus, that we usually keep them on PPIs to keep, but there may be a catch-22 with that. We don't know. So, so that's the recommendation. People, But people are put on these drugs and then they don't come off of them because they get the rebound hyperacidity because the gastrin levels are high once they try to stop. So. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yes. Yeah, and repurposing old drugs for new indications, um, or if you are changing anything from the approved indication or the approved dose, you have to get FDA approval. Now, there are fast track, and I didn't go into that, but you can do fast track if it's a prior approved drug and it's a, a 301B2 process where repurposing old drugs, um, you can expedite it through. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'm sorry. That's from enterochromaffin like cells in the stomach, yes. The ECL like cells. I'm sorry. Our next lecture is Sonia Jacalou. She got a PhD at Rutgers, then she did a postdoctoral position in France. She came back to NCI and she was working with Michael Sporn here at NCI on transforming growth factor beta. She's now in the Cancer Training Branch, Center for Cancer Training at NCI. Her title, Transforming Growth Factor Beta and Lung Tumor Genesis. Sonia. My laboratory was interested in transforming growth factor beta and lung tumor genesis. And good. Okay, why lung cancer? Well, over the past uh, years, lung cancer has become the most common cause of cancer death among both men and women in the U.S. The American Cancer Society estimates that in this year, there'll be over 234,000 newly diagnosed cases of lung cancer among both men and women. And of these, more than 154,000 deaths will occur. So most cases now occur in ex-smokers because the average age of uh, this disease appears at 70 years of age. And this, the uh, five-year survival rate is, is still a dismal less than 15%. Now, the good news is that the number of diagnosed cases and the number of deaths has been decreasing over the decades in this country. The bad news is that uh, with the advent of e-cigarettes and teens catching on to smoking with these new gadgets, it's expected that the uh, the cases of uh, lung cancer will probably increase because these e-cigarettes contain nicotine, just as tobacco does. And we all know that uh, while the incidence of lung cancer is decreasing in this country, and in Europe and Asia, it is increasing by leaps and bounds. So this is a very dangerous and important disease. Now, my lab was interested in uh, transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta for short. TGF beta is a multifunctional regulator of cell growth. It has been shown to be a potent inhibitor of the proliferation of most normal epithelial cells in culture. It shows widespread tissue expression in the human and has been shown to be, play a pivotal role in maintaining epithelial homeostasis. It has also been shown to be associated with various types of cancers, including lung cancer, and it shows a context-dependent inhibition or stimulation of cell proliferation and neoplastic transformation. So when you put all this all together, TGF beta is, is apparently an attractive candidate for new therapeutic intervention approaches. So, to understand transforming growth factor beta, you have to go back to the beginning. And TGF beta has its roots in another protein called sarcoma growth factor. Sarcoma growth factor is a polypeptide secreted by Maloney murine sarcoma virus transformed mouse tribal. Carboblast that is able to stimulate these normal rat carboblasts to form colonies in soft dogger. And this is essentially the transformation assay that was, was used by Joe DeLarco and, and George Todaro and reported in PS, PNAS in, in the late 70s. So, two classes of TGFs were isolated from MSB transformed cells. 
one class was shown to be able to compete with epidermal growth factor, EGF, for receptor binding, and this was called PGF-alpha. Another class was shown to not be able to compete for EGF binding, but whose colony forming activity could be enhanced by, D, by EGF. And this was called TGF beta. So sarcoma growth factor beta, sarcoma, sarcoma growth factor is really a combination of two proteins, TGF alpha and TGF beta. And this was reported by Robertson Sporn in Nature in, 19, in the early 80s. Following this uh, identification of, of two different TGFs, the purification of, uh, of TGF, TGF beta was contemplated and uh, performed. And in 1983, uh, three papers came out by three different authors, all at the all at the NCI, and purified from human platelets, human placenta, and bovine kidney. And to give you some idea of the purification that was involved in, in purifying TGF beta 1 from bovine kidney, 100 grams of bovine kidney was obtained from the slaughterhouse. It was extracted with acid ethanol during the day centrifuge to remove all the gunk. And then the uh, liquid was precipitated with a mixture of ether ethanol of the tune of about 50 liters overnight in the cold room. The next morning, the, uh, the precipitate was redissolved in two liters of acetic acid and then applied to an 80 liter biogel P60 column for purification. One liter fractions were collected and then these were lyophilized and redissolved for further chromatography purification. And the final yield, yield was about six micrograms of PGF beta 1 from 100 grams of tissue. So, to give you some idea of the immense columns that were used to do this, this is a slide of the Biogel P60 columns and shown in the pink arrows. The gallon drum used to collect waste. Now the assay for TGF beta was included the growth of normal rat kidney cells, NRK cells, and cell fiber. So the assay was conducted with using a plating on an agar base, a mixture of media, serum, NRK cells, EGF, which was the growth factor, and a portion of the sample. The plates were incubated for one week at 37 de degrees, stained, and the colonies were counted with an omnicom image analysis system shown at the bottom. Now, if, new, if no TGF beta is present in the sample, then no colony should grow or be counted. If TGF beta is present in the sample, then colonies will, should grow and be counted if they're at a certain size or greater. So uh, the final uh, high pressure uh, liquid chromatography purification was conducted. And this slide shows a uh, polychromide gel uh, separation of this protein. And if you look on, on, uh, on uh, fractions 56 to 60, you'll see a single band migrating at about 25,000 molecular weight, and this is TGF beta. So TGF beta was uh, was credited to be born or raised by Dr. Michael Sporn and Anita Roberts at the NCI. So following the uh, purification of TGF beta protein, the sequence of mature TGF beta monomer was uh, conducted, and TGF beta was found to be a exist initially as a pre-pro TGF beta moiety of, of 391 amino acids. It contained a signal peptide, uh, what is called a latency associated peptide or LAP in the middle, and at the mature carboxy end uh, was mature TGF beta of 112 amino acids. 
Now shown on the upper uh, right panel is a cartoon of the amino acid uh, sequence of, of human PDF beta one. And shown in black are the nine characteristic cysteine residues that is characteristic of PGF beta. Okay, following the purification and the sequence of PGF beta, the crystal structure of PGF beta was, was uh, identified in the 90s. And this happens to be the crystal structure of PGF beta 2. Why TGF beta 2? Because it's apparently much easier to crystallize TGF beta 2 than TGF beta 1. So TGF beta 2 exists as a, as a dimer of two identical monomeric segments held together by an interchain disulfide bond, which contains a hydrophobic pocket. Now, following the uh, the identification of TGF beta per se. And TGF beta, there are really five different isoforms of TGF beta. TGF beta 1, 2, and 3 are found in mammals. TGF beta 4 is found in, in birds and is thought to be a homologue of, TG, of TGF beta 1. And TGF beta 5 is found in amphibians, amphibians and it's thought to be another homologue of the mammalian TGF beta 1. Now, in, in addition to TGF beta per se, there are other molecules that fit into this TGF beta superfamily. This is the, the bone morphogenetic proteins, uh, growth differentiation factors shown in the middle, and there are quite a few, as well as the active ends and inhibitions. Okay? Structurally, they bear a lot of resemblance to the TGF beta per se, but they are, are they are unique proteins themselves. So um, to put all this together, TGF beta exists as a 25,000 molecular weight disulfide bonded homodimer. Three highly homologous isoforms have been identified in humans and mammals, TGF beta one, Two and three. Principal sources of, mam of mam mammalian TGF beta include platelets, bone, and spleen. Most cells are, are able to express TGF beta in its receptors. I would say most normal cells are able to express TGF beta in its, in its receptors. And TGF beta is usually secreted in what's called the latent inactivated form that has to be activated in order for it to do its thing. And the superfamily of TGF beta includes TGF beta, the active ends inhibits the BMPs and the DDS. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me during, okay? Now, when the TGF beta superfamily was identified and there were so many people working on this, this project, uh, it was it was uh, readily observed that there are many biological processes that are controlled by by the superfamily, including such important uh, processes as development, immune system function, reproduction, angiogenesis, aging, tissue repair, metabolic regulation, and proliferation. So there's a whole lot of things that are, are controlled by this superfamily and a whole lot of people interested in working on it and finding out how this proceeds. Now, the, there are many major biolo biological responses that are, can be regulated by TGF beta. And this depends really on the, on the cell type. In, in certain cell types, TGF beta can inhibit proliferation. It can also regulate such, such uh, uh, responses as apoptosis, differentiation, and immune cell function. It can also stimulate the accumulation of extracellular matrix under certain circumstances, and can also promote chemotaxis, again, depending on the cell type. 
Now, a uh, model for, TGF, uh, for the TGF beta pathway was constructed uh, with, uh, with input from several laboratories. And I'll start at the upper left hand side of the screen. The blue represents the TGF beta ligand. Then this could be TGF beta per se, as well as active and inhibitant VMPs, et cetera. The ligand is, is thought to bind to the type 2 TGF beta receptor, shown in pink, which is consistently phosphorylated. Once this uh, complex starts to form, the type 2 receptor then recruits the type 1 receptor and is able to transphosphorylate the type 1 receptor. When this happens, then the complex is able to interact with the regulatory receptor SMAD. And this is a, a little bit complicated because the regulatory receptor SMADs depend on, binding to the SMADs depend on which type of ligand you're talking about. So if we're talking about activin or TGF beta, this we, we talk about the SMAD2 and SMAD3. If the VMPs are involved, then you're talking about either SMAD1, 5, or 8. Again, it depends a lot on the cell type that's involved. So um, once um, once these uh, ligands, once the ligand complex is able to interact with the SMAD, the receptor regulated SMAD, they are transphosphorylated, and when that happens, then then they're able to then bind to another SMAD called the SMAD4, which is called the co-SMAD. So you have a complex of the receptor with the SMADs making a super complex. And this then is a, when it, once it binds to interact with the SMAD4 protein, then it's able to uh, uh, cross into the nucleus and affect transcription, okay? Now the whole thing can be circumvented by what we call inhibitory SMADs. Inhibitory SMADs are SMAD6 and SMAD7, which can short circuit the whole process, including inhibition of growth. So SMAD6 and SMAD7 also depend on what kind of ligand you're talking about. So that's the simple, uh, very uh, concise uh, pathway for about 10 years of work worldwide. So clinically, uh, well, the um, signaling pathway was being worked up. People, the investigators began to become interested in, in TGF beta in the clinic. Clinically, TGF beta was shown to be a tumor, have tumor suppressor properties. Specific, specifically, germline mutations in the TGF beta pathway com component were shown to be able to cause familial predisposition to cancer. And this has been shown by SMAD4 and juvenile polyposis. Secondly, the TGF beta pathway components were shown to be able to be somatically mutated or deleted in some human cancers. This involved the type 2 receptor in human non polyposis colon cancer and the SMAD4 protein in pancreatic cancer. And thirdly, we uh, was able to be shown clinically that the reduced expression of TGF beta signaling pathway components or overexpression of endogenous pathway inhibitors have been shown to be associated with disease progression. And this was involved the type 2 receptor as well as the type 1 receptor in SMAD7, and also a, uh, a interacting protein that often interacts with TGF beta called SKI. Now, clinically, TGF beta has been shown to be a tumor promoter as well. And it's been observed in that TGF, the level of TGF beta 1 is elevated in many types of advanced human tumors, and it correlates 
nicely with metastasis or poor prognosis in many cases. And this has been shown in a number of, of cancer types, including cancers in the lungs. Now I show on the uh, right side of the screen an adenocarcinoma. This happens to be a prosthetic adenocarcinoma stained for 2 beta one And you see the brown type of staining, um, that's indicative of uh, TGF beta one And TGF beta here is able, is in a position to sit at the interface between the tumor and the microenvironment, causing problems. So when we think of TGF beta and carcinogenesis, do we call it a hero or a villain? Well, it turns out it can be both. TGF beta can be a proximal in, in, in sector of the malignant phenotype, but at the same time, it could be a potent growth inhibitor and tumor suppressor, depending on the cell type and the conditions that it's put under. And it could be a pro-metastatic factor as well. So how does it do this? Well, again, after uh, many years of work, a unifying hypothesis was, was conjectured, and it was uh, shown that TGF beta is able to switch from being a tumor suppressor to a tumor promoter or pro oncogenic factor during, con during cancer progression. Well, how does it do this? Well, in normal epithelium, the tumor suppressor activities predominate over the uh, pro oncogenic activities, and you get decrease in cell growth. But as you have tumor genesis or carcinogenesis, you get accumulating changes in genetic and, and, and epigenetic, epigenetic context. So that when, so you begin to lose responsiveness to TGF beta and at the same time, you get you get an either an increase in expression or activation of TGF beta, and then you see that the pro oncogenic activities begin to dominate over the tumor suppressor uh, activities, and this begins to accumulate as uh, the uh, the tumor becomes metastatic. So in addition to the SMAD dependent pathway that I've been talking to you about until now, the story gets a little even more, a little more complex because there are a number of SMAD independent pathways that also can work here. Pathways that in, involve uh, MEK, RAS, RO, and protein phosphatase 2A as for example. Now, we were particularly interested in the RAS MAP kinase pathway because in the KRAS protocol oncogen, KRAS shows an activational mutation in 25 to 50% of human lung adenocarcinomas. Mutation in even one allele of KRAS has been shown to be able to increase the appearance of lung lesion in mice. There is crosstalk between SMAD dependent pathway and the RAS MEK signaling pathway. And activation of the RAS pathway can modulate TGF beta signaling for the SMAD. And this has been shown in a number of cell lines. And in vitro studies have shown that although TGF beta dominates over the mitogenic effect of RAS, activated RAS it can override the antiproliferative effect of TGF beta 1 under certain conditions. So, how does this happen uh, where um, the tumor suppressor? properties of TGF beta can be lost and the tumor promoter effects become uh, enhanced. Well, on the left, on the left side you see a normal TGF beta path signaling pathway that I 
described to you about, and the normal pathway in normal cells would be tumor suppression. But if one has a case of decreased uh, expression of the type 2 receptor, that can result in tumor promotion. Likewise, hyperactivation of the RAS MAP kinase pathway can also lead to tumor promotion, as does as can decrease levels of SMAD or activity of SMAD and compromise effective function in any part of the suppressor arm of CGF beta can result in tumor suppression. So we were particularly interested in the uh, RASMAP kinase pathway. And our broad goal was to determine the role of TGF beta in development and malignant transformation of lung epithelial cells at the NCI. Our, our objectives were threefold to examine the effect of TGF beta 1 deletion and K res mutation alone and in combination on lung tumor incidence and pathology determine the early events in the development of lung lesions and how they progress, and then to identify potential signaling transduction pathway changes with, trans with tumor genesis. We're interested in the mechanism. How does this proceed? So to carry out this work, we used a uh, mouse models. Again, mouse models are very good uh, for assessing mechanisms. We used four mouse models, the AJ mouse, the C57, black six, TGF beta one, heterozygous mouse. And I will kind of abbreviate heterozygous by just calling it a het mouse. The AJ black six, TGF beta one, het mouse, and the TGF beta het, K rest latent activatable mouse. For this one, I'll just call it the het LA mouse, okay, for sake of time. So we asked two questions. First question, does lung tumor genesis affect the TGF beta signaling pathway? And then the reciprocal question, does the TGF beta signaling pathway affect lung tumor genesis? Now, why did we use the aging mouse model? Well, this mouse model has been shown to be very susceptible to chemically induced lung tumors. And the tumors develop in a time-dependent manner such that it progresses through benign hyperplasia to adenomas to carcinomas. The carcinomas that form are histologically similar to human lung adenocarcinomas. Remember, we want to, we want to uh, parlay this into relevance to humans. And the same molecular mutations occur in both human and mouse lung tumors. For example, overexpression of RAS and loss of P53 as well. So to, uh, to uh, turn on this uh, tumor genesis, we use ethyl carbamate. Ethyl carbamate can be metabolized through, through two different pathways. There's a detoxification pathway shown on the left where um, uh, it's formed a uh, simple ethanol, CO2, and ammonia. But it can also go through a bioactivation pathway through CYP2E1, where it forms a vinyl carbonate and a vinyl carbonate epoxide, which is kind of bad news because these uh, can bind to macromolecules like DNA. So, we injected two-month-old mice with ethyl carbamate and then sacrificed 20 mice per sacrifice over a period of 12 months. We extracted the lungs and uh, um, put them in the tissue sample and then stained for um, TGF beta-1 ligand as well as the type 1 and type 2 TGF beta receptors. And to make a long story short, when you look at uh, the panel on the, on the right side of the screen for type 2 receptor, you see decreased expression staining 
of the type 2 receptor protein in, this, in these tumors. And the um, expression of the type 2 receptor decreases as tumor genesis increases from two months to four months to eight months. Now, to show this more convincingly on the left side of the panel, you'll see a comparison of staining for the type 1 and type 2 receptors. While we see uh, bright staining for the type 1 receptors panels A and B, comparison with the type 2 receptors shows, uh, shows comparable staining in the normal uh, normal bronchial shown in the uh, red arrows. But when one looks at the tumor shown by the pink arrows, you see almost uh, appreciably lower staining. So we see decreased expression of the type two receptor protein in these tumors. We also uh, looked at the, the mRNA for the type one and type two receptors using northern blotting. And shown, um, we're showing five different uh, cell lines for uh, we stain for we stain we uh, probe for the D2 receptors. And I'd like to draw your attention to the PCC4 cell line, which was a uh, a ethylcarbamate induced uh, tumor in AJ mice, and we see here that there's a uh, decreased expression of the type 1 receptor and type 2 receptor compared to the other cell lines. Okay, so this mirrors the decrease in both the levels of the type 2 receptor protein as well as mRNA in these uh, tumors. We also looked at uh, the expression of TGF beta 1 ligand and the two receptor proteins and messages in benzpyrene induced aging mass lung tumors. And shown on the top uh, part of the screen is immunohistochemical staining for the three proteins. And here again in panel C on the right, you showed, you can see decreased expression of the type 2 receptor compared to the other two proteins. When we did in situ hybridization to look at the, the mRNAs for these proteins. Again, we see decreased uh, expression of the type of the type two receptor um, uh, mRNA in panel F on the right. Uh, the bottom panel you see shows the immunohistochemical chemical staining for uh, all three proteins in normal bronchioles from these mice. So we're seeing the same behavior both in the ethylcarbamate and benzpyrene-induced tumors in these mice. So this leads us to believe that the decreased expression of the type 2 receptor is one mechanism that may be working here to promote lung tumor, uh, tumor genesis. Next, we ask the question, does deletion of TGF-beta-1 affect lung tumor genesis? And for this, we started using the C57 black 6 TGF-beta-1 mouse. Now, we got involved with this because um, the, the TGF-beta-1 knockout mouse was made in the 90s, and it's born, but um, compared to its Wild type litter mates and heterozygous litter mates, it's kind of on the small side. And gradually, at about a week to 10 days, it begins to show signs of not, not doing so well. And by 21 days, these mice are essentially dead. So they're not very good models for tumor genesis if one wants to carry this out for several months. But um, when we, uh, the heterozygous litter mate is able to thrive and reproduce. So this is a better model for looking at tumor genesis. So Lology Wakefield treated these mice. She was interested in liver, liver tumor genesis. She treated these heterozygous mice with, uh, with dinitro, 
nitrosamine, which is a liver carcinogen. And she found in the, uh, shown in the uh, red, that there were, it was enhanced uh, liver tumor genesis in these hemp mice compared to the wild type litter mice. But surprisingly, she found even more lung tumors in these mice compared to the wild type litter mice. So we began to collaborate on this. So um, in order to C57 black six mice aren't a good model for lung tumor genesis. So in collaboration with Dr. Wakefield, we crossed the uh, C57 black six head mice with the AJ TGF beta one wild type mice that we had, we can get obtained commercially to develop the F1 generation of what we call AJ black six head, head and wild type litter mice. We, uh, our intention was to use the F1 generation to treat with carcinogen to follow the lung tumor development. So before we did this, we uh, wanted to know that our, our crosses were working. So essentially, the top panel showed the immunohistochemistry of uh, wild type and het mice stained for TGF beta 1. And in the middle panel, you'll see the uh, uh, middle panel, middle top panel, you'll see reduced staining of the normal bronchial compared to the wild type on the right. And the mirror below that is the in situ hybridization for the RNA using an antisense probe, which shows also decreased expression of TGF beta 1 here. This is what we expect. We have only one allele of TGF beta. We expect to have decreased expression of the protein in the message. Shown in the bottom is also northern blotting and competitive RT PCR. And uh, this also shows reduced expression of TGF beta 1 message in the head mice compared to the wild type mice. So we're working with the proper, proper model now. So we did the same thing we did before with AJ mice. We treated these mice with ethyl carbamate and uh, sacrificed. This time we had two groups, the head and the wild type, over a period of one year. And shown in this rather complex, uh, very colorful slide is essentially in uh, panels A and B at the top. You see essentially increased tumor incidence and multiplicity of the, uh, in the orange bars compared to, which denote the head mice compared to the, the uh, wild type mice shown by the green bars. Now you see increased tumor incidence and multiplicity and decreased tumor latency in the head mice shown in orange compared to the wild type mice shown in green. Now this is shown very effectively in panel C in the, for the carcinoma for, because while the head mice begin to show carcinomas by four months after injection of the carcinogen, it takes almost 12 months or longer before comparable tumors start appearing in the wild head mice. We stain for the type 2 uh, receptor protein in lung lesions from these mice. And shown at the bottom in the carcinomas on the bottom right, you see decreased uh, staining for the type 2 receptors in tumors of the, the head mice compared to their wild type litter mice. We looked at the uh, relative levels of the type 2 mRNA in lesions from these mice and shows essentially decreasing levels of the type 2 receptor mRNA with increasing lung tumor genesis as one proceeds from hyperplasia to adenomas to carcinoma. Okay. So our next question was, does deletion of TJ beta 1 and mutation of KRAS together affect lung tumor genesis. 
And for this, we use uh, yet another mouse model. This mice is uh, the TGF beta 1 head K ref latent activatable mouse. And to generate these mice, it took a long time. So essentially, we crossed TGF beta 1 head mice and C57 black text with K ref latent activatable mice, the LA mice to generate four different genotypes. Um, the uh, TGIF beta-1 head KRAS light and activatable mass, I'll refer to as a double mutant. The uh, TGIF beta-1 wild type KRAS light and activatable that I'll refer to as the uh, single mutant and the other uh, head single mutant and the wild type litter mate. So shown here is a, uh, a slide of the uh, of a histological dissection of these lungs that, uh, after four months. And one shows pearly white, pearly white nodules on the double mutant shown in A, as well as the single LA mutant in B. The other two genotypes uh, do not uh, sh do not show uh, significant nodules even after several months of looking. We next look at the effect of TGF beta one deletion and K rest mutation on mouse survival using these four genotypes, and show that essentially I'd like to direct your attention to the box showing A B which shows the double mutants and the KRAS uh, LA mutants having significantly de decreased lifespans compared to the wild type and the single head mutant. We examined pathology of the lung lesions in these mice. And uh, if you look at hyperplasian adenomas, the um, we show increased hyperplasia, increased levels of hyperplasia and adenoma in the single LA mutant mice shown in green, but increased carcinomas in the double mutant shown at the bottom in, in uh, red in the adenocarcinomas. So it seems like there's accelerated production of these adenocarcinomas in the double mutant mice. Now we stain for the type two receptor in TGF beta one protein uh, protein in these lung lesions, and showed essentially reduced levels of expression of the TGF beta one ligand and the type two receptor in the double mutant mice, shown by the pink arrows on the right compared to the, the wild type litter mates. Now we we're also interested in how the SMADs were behaving. And so we uh, looked at expression of the SMADs as well as the type two receptor in these different mice. And shown at the top is essentially in the double mutants we show essentially expedited reduction of the type two receptor uh, protein and increased production of the SMAD3 protein in these in these mice. We show essentially no different in the other two mice genotypes. So putting this real real uh, all together, I won't kind of bore you with this, but if you concentrate on the KRAS and RAF1, which we're also interested, we show in these mice but using real-time R3CR. Reduced uh, type 2 receptors and SMADs in the carcinomas, as well as expedited KRAS and RAF production in these mice. Looking at the apoptotic index in the, uh, in the single mutant and double mutant, we saw significantly reduced apoptosis in the double mutant adenomas, shown in red compared to the single mutant late in the early mouse on the left. 
So this model shows quite effectively that uh, decreased expression of the type two receptor can lead to lung tumor promotion. Activation of the RASMAP kinase pathway can also lead to lung tumor promotion. Decreased levels of SMAP4 can result in lung tumor promotion. And compromised apoptosis is also a mechanism by, by which lung tumor promotion can be exasperated. Now, in the more recent uh, years, several anti-TGF beta compounds have been uh, developed and they're currently in clinical trials. I can't really report much uh, to you on them, but there are various companies that are involved in this, like Genzyme, Pfizer, Pfizer Antisense Pharma. And so we, they're working on this in a variety of different cancer tumors, including lung cancer. And we expect to have some feedback from this in the coming months, hopefully. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that all this uh, diligent work to uh, assess the TGF beta pathway and what it can and cannot do can be translated into helping human patients with in need of uh, cures. So I'd like to acknowledge the people who worked on this pro project who are now uh, taken off to uh, bigger and better activities. Uh, Jerry Anderson, Yang Kang, Alina Novova, Joyce Nopandi, and Sarah Rumpress. And I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge Tyler Jacks for the, uh, the KRAS mouse, okay? If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them at this point. Come on, I couldn't have overwhelmed you. I know you're hungry, but come on. One question. Yes, you're a deer. <laughs> It's tough to say because I think they're all important. And I think when you look at lung cancer, you really have to look at the stage of lung cancer. If you can find it when it's a more early stage and that late stage, you, you have different possibilities. You have more possibilities. Yeah. I'm kind of hedging here because it depends, you know. Well, more difficult in human patients, easier in mouse models, okay? Now, we, 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 when we got into this uh, project, we were working with the really early version of the KRS mouse, okay? Our KRS mice got too many tumors, they died too quickly, but now they have engineered a better, well, not a better, several better KRAS mice that you can turn on at your will and so your mice don't die prematurely from too much tumor overload. That was our problem, okay? All right. Any more questions? Come on, it's an exciting field. She just has to get into it, you know? Okay. Yes. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I wouldn't say um, that was an early version. I think now, um, if farmers, well, if you go to pharmaceutical companies, they have it really wrapped up to a science where it can be purified, you know. This was like a homemade version of just putting columns together, and this is the best we can do in the 80s at the NCI, you know. And when that work was being done, they really didn't know 
you know, they were trying several different types of purification systems and that one turned out to be the best that they could at that time. Okay, excellent question. Okay. Okay, yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I was her second postdoc. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. Go get dinner. <laughs> okay.